In this video, we're going to talk about beam deflections. So let's imagine a simple cantilever beam anchored to a wall. And then what we're going to do is apply a point load at the end. And so it's going to bend, in this case, upward like that. And what we want to be able to describe is the shape of this beam under an applied load. So let's trace a beam here. And I'm just going to use one of my rubber bars as kind of a model to get a nice curved shape. So let me trace this. So this is just going to serve as a model for our geometry. So there is our beam upwards. And now an important thing is what we're going to describe is the deflection of the neutral axis. So let me trace out the neutral axis, which just goes right along the center line of our beam here, because for simplicity, I'm just going to consider this to be a rectangular or square cross section. So there's our neutral axis. Let's define our coordinate direction. So a line coming out from the wall, this coordinate direction will be X. And so what this is going to represent is that when the beam is at equilibrium, the neutral axis is just going to lie right along uh, that axis. And what we're going to want to describe here is the deflection from the neutral axis, this distance here that we're going to call V, which is going to be a function of X. So V will be the deflection or the displacement of the neutral axis from uh, the equilibrium point. When we studied a beam applied to a pure moment, what we did is we applied a twist at the end. And since the moment that we apply is constant along the axis, we found that this bar curved into a perfect circle. And all we needed to describe that circle is what its radius was. Are we applying a weak moment where the radius is large or a strong moment where the radius is tight? On this beam, the moment is maximum here and zero where the point load is applied. And so it varies along the distance. And so what we're going to do is we're going to break this up effectively into a bunch of little circles. So let's take a little point here. We're going to call it point A. And that's just going to be our point of interest. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume a small distance here. And I'm going to kind of exaggerate it here because eventually we're going to do this in terms of differentials. But another point off to the right. And we're going to define ds to be the arc length of the neutral axis from one point to another. And then what we're going to do is assume that this is composed of a bunch of little arcs that are little tiny pieces of circles, but circles of different radii of curvature. So here, what we're going to do is we're going to draw a line, which goes off to some point far away. And this line is going to be perpendicular to the neutral axis. And then I'm going to draw another line here uh, at our point differentially far away, which is also going to be perpendicular to the neutral axis. And those lines are going to intersect somewhere up here. And we're going to call that point O. And so O would be the center of curvature. We're going to define a few angles here. So if I draw a vertical, a theta will be the distance uh, that this line has swept. R is going to be the radius of curvature at this kind of local point A. And our little differential change here will be d theta. And so this is what we're going to use to define the geometry uh, right around our point A. And so now what, what I need to do is we need to zoom in on uh, this piece and kind of redraw it so we can be a little bit more careful. OK, so let's zoom in. Here's our x-axis. Here's our neutral axis, which I'm just drawing as a single line. And here's going to be our point of interest, A. And remember, what we want to do is understand the change as we move from A to some other point here uh, to the right. And the length of this arc, the arc of our neutral axis, is going to be our distance, uh, ds. The distance of point A from our original position, which falls along this x-axis, is going to be the def deflection V. And if we move a little bit to the right, this distance is not quite the same. So we're going to call this V plus dV. So a little bit of differential change. Our change in distance along the x-axis from this point to this point is going to be dx. And now we can see that dV here is simply uh, forms almost like a little triangle here. So this distance dv is just the, the difference uh, 
from the original position at A to the change to the point a little bit to the right. Now our circular arc, remember, is formed by a radius of curvature, which is following this line, goes off to some far point, uh, O, which is kind of way up here off the screen on my zoomed in picture, but this is going to form a right angle. And now we remember that this line that's going off here, we, we described it as following some angle from the vertical, uh, which is theta. So the angle that this line here, R, the green line sweeps out, that angle here is also going to be the same as the angle of this little triangle here, right? Because these lines are perpendicular. So the angle that this makes with the vertical is the same angle that this triangle is going to make with the horizontal. At our point to the right, we have the completion of our circular arc. So this is also going to follow a radius of curvature. And it's also going to go far off the screen. And those two lines are going to intersect way up there. This change in angle here we called d theta. OK, so if we recall our geometry of our little circular arc here, our little differential change, we have the relationship from geometry that r, the radius of curvature, times d theta, so this change in angle, is equal to ds. That just comes from the geometry of a circle. Now, all the cases we're going to be interested in are a limit. We're going to be interested in a limit where these angles and deflections are actually relatively small. Because if you think about something like a building, if you have beams in your house that are holding up the house, you want your deflections to be relatively small. And so that's the limit we're going to take. And so rather than worrying about the difference of the change of this arc length, we're going to replace the change of the arc length ds with the change in distance along this x-axis dx. Because we know when we have very small angles here, that if I take a solid line, I can rotate it up a little bit and I can nearly complete the triangle without having to worry about the change in the length of this kind of curved segment here. So we're going to make the approximation for simplicity that ds is approximately equal to dx. So that's going to be one relationship that we use. The other is that we're going to look at this triangle here and we're just going to see by geometry that the tangent of our angle theta is equal to this distance here, which is dv, divided by this distance here, which is dx. And so this is the other relationship we're going to use. And again, if we make the approximation that these angles here are relatively tiny, the tangent of theta is approximately equal to the angle theta. And that you can remind yourself if you carry out the Taylor series expansion for the function tangent of theta. For small angles, it's approximately the same as theta. And the reason we want to do this is because otherwise we'd have some relationships that are a little bit difficult to manipulate. So here I have the relationship that dv dx is equal to theta. And if I rearrange this expression here, I can write it as d theta dx is equal to 1 over the radius of curvature. So now let's take this expression here and take its derivative. So I'm going to take my expression, dv dx is equal to theta, take its derivative once. So that would tell me the second derivative of the deflection is equal to d theta dx, which if I simply substitute in over here, is 1 over the radius of curvature. And so this is really the relationship that we are after. And so this final relationship here that we're going to use for the remainder of our lectures on beam deflections are that the second derivative of the, this deflection is equal to 1 over the radius of curvature. And remember, the radius of curvature is really a function of x. It's just we're talking about right at this local point. So the radius of curvature is going to vary all along the length of the beam. OK, so we just derived the second derivative of the deflection v is equal to 1 over the radius of curvature, where the radius of curvature varies along the length of the beam. Now, if you go back to some of our earlier lectures and in some of our notes, we'll recall that we had a relationship for a beam in pure bending when we were applying just a moment uh, between the radius of curvature and the applied moment. Now, I'm not going to derive that relationship again, so you'll have to go back and look at it. But remember, all we're assuming is that along the long length of our beam, we're assuming that it's made up of a bunch of little perfect elements just applied to a pure moment. 
So if you go back, you'll find that our relationship for the radius of curvature was the applied moment m, which in our case is a function of x, divided by e i, where i is the moment of inertia, e is Young's modulus, or the elastic modulus, and m is the applied moment. And so this is really our relationship that we're going to use uh, for calculating the beam deflections. Now to complete the problem though, we need uh, a little bit of extra information, which is what we need to know what the applied moment is as it varies along the length of the beam. And so again, it, you're going to have to go back to our lectures on the shear and bending moment diagram, but if you go back to those lectures, you'll remember that we had the following relationship. So the derivative of this shear diagram, so here capital V instead of the deflection, which is small v. So the derivative of the shear diagram we found was equal to the negative of Q, where Q was equal to the force per unit length. So a distributed load along the length of a beam. So we had beams that we, for example, we drew so in that case, we had beams where we talked about it being subject to maybe its own weight. And so we talked about it being subject to an applied load, which is uniform or distributed along the length of the beam. So for a beam, cantilever beam under its own weight, Q would be a constant. You'll also recall if you go back to our shear and bending moment diagrams that the derivative of the moment diagram with respect to X was equal to the shear. And so these two relationships that we derived previously from shear and bending give us a way to go from uh, the loading up to the deflection. So we take our known loads Q, so it's either a distributed load, or if we have point loads, Q is just zero. That allows us to integrate up and compute the shear as a function of X. Then we take the shear and we integrate that upwards and we find the moment as a function of x. And then we take our final equation, which is our deflection equation, and we integrate that twice and that gives us small v or the deflection as a function of x. And we'll walk through a number of examples where we do this, but we take the loading and we integrate to get the moment and then we integrate twice to get the deflection. And that will allow us to calculate the shape of the beam and that's going to be good under the approximation that our deflections are relatively small. So in the coming lectures, let's work a few examples of this to see how it works in practice.